So yeah, thank you very much for, for having me and for discussing with me about my, my PhD dissertation, which speaks about impure set. So I try to go straight to the point. So what is an impure set? We have uh, in contemporary literature, two different definitions of impure set. So the first definition says that an impure set is a set whose members are not set, but other abstract object and examples are uh, the singleton containing Sherlock Holmes and the set of cardinal numbers. And the second definition says that a set is impure if and only if its members are concrete. So uh, the classic, classic example is the singleton containing Socrates. And the second definition can be extended to cover all sets having concrete object in the transitive pleasure, such as, for instance, the set containing singleton Plato. So in this talk, I would like to focus on the second kind of object, which I argue to be more problematic, but my definition will uh, slightly change and we will see it later. So first of all, why, uh, I can use this, okay. How can, uh, yeah, why it is important to speak about impure set? Because impure set are uh, somehow too uh, physical for the mathematician and to mathematical for the physicists. And so I argue that the right place to discuss about impure set is philosophy. And uh, indeed, in analytic philosophy, we have a lot of examples involving impure set. Uh, the famous case is fine asymmetry. So uh, singleton Socrates essentially contains Socrates while uh, the other way around does not hold. And also Linné yes, they spoke about impure sets, uh, saying that impure sets are thin relative to their members. So I argue that in order to understand this kind of this, this claims in analytic philosophy, we have to do better understand the nature of impure set. So uh, today I will stress two relevant questions. So the first is, are impure set concrete or abstract? And the second is, how do we acquire knowledge about impure set? But I will focus on the first because it's a lot of uh, work. So um, of course, the first question and uh, the definition I gave above um, involves an idea of what abstractness and concreteness are. And I will use Lewis' way of negation, saying that an abstract object is an object that has no spot temporal location and uh, that is causally inefficacious. Uh, while a concrete object is an object that has spot temporal location and is causally efficacious. Uh, so my plan is to briefly discuss Madi account for impure set and Parson account for impure set, and then um, I will move on on my own idea, my own proposal based on Zalta abstract copies. And of course, this is a work in progress, so uh, suggestion are welcome. So uh, Madi account uh, claims that impure set are fully concrete objects. And so uh, there, that impure set has spots temporary located precisely where the concrete things in their transitive closure are located. And we have also an epistemic claim uh, according to which we perceive impure set. But yeah, so this account can be problematic because um, for example, we can say that perception is somehow hypotrophic in that it gives less set. Uh, I mean, it gives access to less set the um, compared to what we want to account for. And this objection is stressed by Interalia and Chiara. So for instance, he says that the singleton set of an apple looks, feels, smells, and tastes exactly like the apple and is located in exactly the same spot at exactly the same time, but it is a distant entity. And of course, this objection can be extended to cover either or the set so we can ask, for instance, what is the perceptive difference between uh, singleton X and the set containing singleton X? And I argue that uh, another objection can be stressed and goes somehow the other way around because perception can be, can be taken to be hypertrophic because it can uh, give access to more set than required. And this is the case, I argue, for uh, coextensional sets having different predicates. Because different predicates plausibly correspond to different perception, but extensionality, so co-extensionality, uh, seems indispensable for set. So the classic example is the set was predicates are having a heart and having a kidney. And of course, we have just one set, but two perceptions. And uh, last objection to Madi uh, account for set 
is that, uh, and this objection is stressed in Chiara, Mine, and Carson. Uh, so if in perceiving an object X, we do not perceive some essential properties P that makes X identical to A, then what we are perceiving is not A. And the particular declination against Madi proposal is that since we do not perceive, for instance, that membership is not transitive or that set are identical if they have the same members, then we are not perceiving set. And of course, the question is, what are we perceiving? And the, the classic reply is aggregates, so collection of objects changing in time. Uh, so the debate uh, over Madi account is really interesting, but unfortunately I have no time to get into the details, but I think that some conclusive remarks could be that perception is either too strong or too weak uh, for, accounting, uh, to, for accounting for set theory, impure set theory, and that perception uh, of impure set does not account for our understanding of set and set theory. So uh, let's move on to Parsons' account of impure set. And uh, Parson claimed that impure set are quasi-concrete object. And so we have a general definition. So X is quasi-concrete, if and only if X is abstract in the sense of lacking like spots temporal location, and X has the intrinsic property of, of being related to the concrete. And the Parkinson examples for quasi-concrete object are types, shapes, sense qualities, and of course, impure set. Then we have a criterion of identity. Uh, claiming that X is the same quasi-concrete object as Y, if not only if X and Y have the same intrinsic property of being related to all and only the same concrete. So here it is important to understand which kind of relation is in play. And the person is clear about this because uh, it is a relation of representation and the relation has to be spelled out in terms of um, uh, embodiment or instantiation. So his example is a shape, is determined, embodied, instantiated by the concrete object having that shape. But then if this is the case, we have uh, a problematic uh, examples and concern precisely in pure set because concrete members do not represent the set in the same way in which tokens represent their types or in which a concrete object represents sense quality or a shape. And an example could be the set containing me and my laptop is not wholly instantiated by my, me or by my laptop taken separately. And okay, Parson has a reply for this. So uh, he claims that impure set are represented by the meriological sum of uh, their concrete elements. But I think that this is problematic because a different set can be represented by the same meriological sum. And I will propose this example. So the set containing Socrates and Plato and the set containing all Socrates part plus all Plato parts are two different sets, but are represented by the same meriological sum, namely the meriological sum of Socrates plus Plato. Then I will propose another objection against uh, parts of quasi-concrete object. And um, this objection goes as follows. So if we embrace the following three principles, uh, then we can construct um, a counterexample. So uh, we're gonna take weak location, claiming that X is weakly located at air, at the region hair, if and only if air is not completely free of X, and we, we can embrace exact location. So X is exactly located at air, if and only if X has exactly the same space, shape and size as, as air and stand, in all the spatial temporal rela relation to other entities as does air. And then the, the third principle is constituency. So if Y is a constituent of X and Y is exactly located at air, then X is weakly located at air. And here being a constituent of is a generic relation which includes being part of, being a member of, being one of, and so on. So starting from this three principle, we can um, construct Sorry, the, the, these uh, three uh, claims, uh, which are jointly inconsistent. So we can say that impure set are abstract object composed by concrete object. And this seems to follow from person account. And then we have that concrete object have spatiotemporal location and this follow from the definition of concrete object. And also that all objects are at least weakly located where the constituents are located. And this follows from constituency. But these claims are jointly inconsistent. So we have to reject one of this. 
and the friends of parts and account cannot reject the first, of course. The second seems highly plausible. Maybe they can reject the third, but I think that at least they have the burden of proof of explaining why for quasi-concrete object constituency does not hold. And so uh, I have some conclusive remarks about parts and quasi-concrete objects. And I think that is criterion of identity and its general definition have to be revised, but it's not sure that the revision goes without problem. And also that it is not clear how and whether abstract objects can be composed by concrete ones without being themselves spatial temporal located. So um, let's move on to my own proposal. And um, my proposal is based on the basic idea according to which all objects that we consider are already conceptualized. And as an example, we can say in considering Socrates, we already consider him as an object having some properties such as being a human being, being a philosopher, being Greek. And this is possible because of conceptual work on something concrete. And of course, this idea is um, all that's philosophy itself. We can find this idea or I think that that is close to this idea in um, Aristotle categories and in Frege Grundlagen. And recently it is expressed by Thomason and fall under the name of uh, conceptual analysis. And to, to better understand what a conceptual analysis is, we can quote, uh, I would like to quote Bennett 2017. And uh, the quotation goes as follows. So we know how to individuate and count cats and dogs, we know the difference between one bush and three bushes. We know how many daffodils we planted by the driveway. This ability to individuate and count shows that we have the concept, whether or not we could even articulate or define it. So my um, idea is that objects of our conceptual analysis are not identical to concrete objects in front of us. And that, and this is maybe ugly controversial, but something conceptualized is already something that is to some extent abstract. However, these objects which are abstract can be linked to the concrete. And to understand this idea, we can make a comparison with Husserl theory of noemata, according to which each intentional state is direct to add something. And the content of intentionality is different from the object the intentional act is referred to. And his example is the perceived tree is not the tree of the external world, rather a sense of the perception of that tree. So um, basically, noemata are abstract conceptualized objects, which can be related to something concrete. And I argue that in set theory, at least in impure set theory, of course, um, this mechanism is in place. So this is close to what we do in set theory. We, we put something in a set and putting something in a set requires a process of conceptualization somehow. So, and something conceptualizes something abstract. And so supposedly concrete members are abstract objects. And these objects have uh, a relation to the concrete. And now I will try to, uh, to explain how this relation uh, could work. So we have Zalta object theory, and this theory is able to, yeah, to modelize, uh, for instance, Husserl Noemata, and this is shown in Zalta uh, 1988, and also in a paper, in my paper forthcoming. And uh, I will argue that Zalta object theory can be a model also for impure set. And uh, of course, in order to understand this, we have to, to, sh to show some main features of Zalta object theory. So first of all, we have a fixed domain of objects. So object exists at every word. And then we have a distinction between abstract object and ordinary object. So X is abstract definitely if there is no word uh, at which X is concrete. And examples are numbers, set, ideas, Sherlock Holmes, and so on. And um, by contrast, uh, X is ordinary if and only if there is at least a word at which X is concrete. And so examples can be Britney Spears, of course, and my sister that I don't have. So uh, given this, we have that ordinary objects simply exemplify properties and that abstract objects both exemplify and encode properties. And this is quite peculiar of a Zalta account because we have two model predications. And so uh, an abstract object encode a property if this property characterizes or determines that object, while an abstract object exemplifies that property if that property does not determine and characterize that object. 
So it can be useful now to, to show, yeah, so stress some examples from Zalta. So the empty set encodes being a set with no members and being a subset of all, all other set. And it exemplifies being abstract, not having a mass, while Sherlock Holmes encodes being a detective and living in London. And it exemplifies being fictional, being admired by modern criminologists and so on. So this account, so Zelta object theory can be a model for uh, Usser Noemata, and uh, this goes in this way. So we, we, we can consider the, the, the external world directly. So this tree is an, an ordinary object exemplifying some properties and let's say uh, being partially green. And a subject intentional state directed toward that tree is associated with an abstract object encoding some properties that the tree exemplifies. So for instance, if I perceived the tree as partially green, my noema directed to other tree would be an abstract object encoding being partially green. And so we can ask uh, whether this uh, intentional object could be um, a good, I mean, a good model for impure set theory. But I think that we have problem because if supposedly concrete members of impure set are object of intentionality, then set theory uh, runs the risk of being subjective. Because if, for instance, I have an hallucination and I see the tree as partially red in front of me, then my noema would wrongly suggest that uh, this object has this property. And so my proposal is to, to take another device from Zalta object theory. And the device uh, that I would like to take is abstract copies or individual concept, and I will define this. As Zalta does. So C is the abstract copy of uh, the ordinary object X. If and only have C encodes on and only the properties that X exemplifies. So basically, we have an abstract object, which is a copy of uh, an ordinary one. And example, of course, uh, S is Socrates' abstract copy. If and only have C encodes all and only the properties that Socrates exemplifies. So this copy would encode being a philosopher, being Greek and so on, and also uh, would exemplify properties such as being abstract and being Socrates copy. Then we have these copies, okay. And uh, we wonder whether this copy are the, the, the good candidate to account for impure set theory, but maybe there is a further problem because object of set theory and in particular your element have properties such as being set theoretical object, being member of their singletons or being logical atomic object. And also this property can be not compatible with the, prob the property of ordinary object. So we, we could ask from where abstract copies take this set theoretical properties. And it seems implausible that they take from the ordinary object of which there are copies and so they cannot encode them. Uh, they may be exemplify them, but this solution seems ad hoc because why we can wonder why a concept of someone, something would be supposed to involve properties from set theory. And I think that uh, we can find a solution looking at the definition of your element. So we can take the definition. So an object X is a your element, if and only if X cannot be a set, X cannot be contain set or, mem or members and X can belong to set. And then I will try to add another definitional feature to um, your element. So I propose that a new element is an object that refers to another object because we have uh, Socrates uh, singleton and as Sherlock Holmes singleton. So the your element is uh, it's never, so to say, alone. It is always uh, attached to another object. And what kind of object it refer to? It can refer to, I argue, abstract object or abstract copies. So basically we can think about your elements uh, as functions saturated by either abstract object or abstract copies. And the function takes, so to say, an abstract object and give it back with an additional conceptual content. In this case, the uh, conceptual content of set theory. So uh, basically we have singleton Socrates uh, that contains the function your element saturated by Socrates abstract copy. And so uh, all this um, implies a revision of the definition of impure set. And I think that we can combine the definition one and two for impure set because we can say that impure set are set was members uh, or element in the transitive closure are abstract objects. 
Uh, nonetheless, these abstract objects are of a particular kind having relations with something that is or can be concrete. So a set is impure if and only if its member, its element in its transitive closure are abstract copies of ordinary object. And so, uh, of course, the account seems really luxurious. I mean, it's not a parsimonious uh, ontology, but I argue that it's close to the way which we work somehow. We will never bear in mind ordinary object, ordinary concrete object. We rather have some representation of them. And also the account can give clues for the understanding of the notion of set in general. And this I, I didn't show, but can be shown. And uh, also it avoids the problem that we have with Madi and Parson account. For instance, it provides a picture of impure set as mathematical object and provides a more precise idea of how abstract object and are linked with, uh, with concrete object. And also we can, uh, we can think about application, such as uh, the fact that it allows to argue against fine counterexample with Singleton Socrates for, or for whom uh, who, uh, who would like to argue against fine counterexample. And also it suggests that ontological dependence between set and members can be mediate. And also it allowed to modify its Alta uh, 2006 version of uh, of, uh, of account for impure set, which is, I argue, highly problematic. So here are some references and um, thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Valentina. Are there any questions? <laughs> yes, so Hajir, please. Okay, can you hear me? Uh, not so well. Um, what about now? Yeah, better. Thank okay, you. so um, you mentioned um, Bennett and uh, her idea of conceptualization, I guess. Uh, uh, do you think that her idea um, imposes a kind of existential um, demand on the object? Like as soon as we have a concept of something, that thing exists? Uh, so thank you for the question. I don't think that in Bennett uh, account is the case. I just use the quotation because uh, I think that it's a great explanation of how uh, conceptual analysis could work. But he, uh, actually, he is uh, yeah he criticizes uh, conceptual analysis. So finally, it's not the case in Bennett, but it may be the case. Uh, I mean, I use a neo menungian approach to, to, to abstract objects. And so you have a quantification over uh, abstract object in general, even for object that don't, I mean, like impossible object or something like, um, yeah, fictional characters. So you have, yeah, the, the domain of existence is really, uh, yeah, unrestricted. Thank you very much. Okay, Andrea Weber. Um, I have a very basic question because I'm, I don't quite know why the uh, um, distinction between pure sets and impure sets is um, metaphysically important. Um, why do we have this distinction at all? And if I understand you correctly at the end, uh, where you talk about abstract copies of uh, concrete things, um, you somehow conflate this distinction as well, because then your impure sets in a way become uh, pure. So why is that a meaningful distinction or an, an important distinction in metaphysics between pure sets and impure sets? Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, I think that it is kind of important, but it is important to uh, reduce this di distinction uh, at, at the level of set. Uh, but there still is a distinction, distinction between a set with no reference to the concrete at all and a set which refers to the concrete. So I think that this is some metaphysical important distinction to know if you are speaking about uh, abstract object, purely abstract object or abstract object linked with the concrete. So the interest of the, the employee of Zalta account for speaking about impure set is to show that uh, abstract object have linked with something concrete and how the linked is, can be formalized. 
Okay, but in a way, all abstract objects can be linked with the concrete. For example, if I uh, now uh, think very deeply uh, about the number two, then the number two has the uh, uh, property that it has been thought about by me right now. So in a way, it's linked to a concrete object, namely me. Um, so you, you have to say a bit more about what exactly makes the link in impure sets uh, stronger than the link uh, to concrete objects in uh, normal uh, abstract uh, entities. Yeah. yeah, you're right. At the same time, uh, Xalta account allows to distinguish between uh, the way in which the number two have this property and the way in which an abstract copy has this property because uh, the, the number two exemplifies the property of being thinking of, uh, and while the uh, abstract copies encode that property and so you have two more two distinct uh, a distinction metaphysically relevant I think but yeah, okay, good point. I mean, yeah, abstract object can be linked to the concrete, but mm -hmm. not in the same way. Mm -hmm. So the, the, yeah, the specific mode of uh, abstract copies allow to have really a copy of an, of mm -hmm. an object. While the property of thinking about the number two is an, yeah, an intentional property. Mm -hmm. But yeah, 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 thank you. Mm -hmm.